from microscopic bacteria and fungi to complex forest ecosystems and humans. Biodiversity represents every single aspect of life on this planet. But we often think that biodiversity is about preserving Amazon forests, for example, or rare animal species in Africa. Well, it's not exactly that. Biodiversity, first of all, is about the interconnectedness of different genes and different species on this planet. For example, the connection between us humans and different food varieties that we consume and the nutrients or the bacteria and chemicals that come together with this food. Or the connection between us and let's say different plants that dictate and influence weather conditions in different places where we live or even the interconnectedness between us humans and microscopic bacteria that is used in medicine to help doctors save lives. This is Live Sustainably with me, Anastasia, and today we are getting fascinated by the delicate tangle of life, biodiversity, and the incredible impact that it has on our lives. In Victorian Britain, it was possible for people to eat a different apple variety every single day for four years without ever repeating and having the same apple twice. Today, though, supermarkets are only offering four to five different apple varieties, and all of them are very similar in texture and sweetness. Even though there are more than 1,500 different varieties of bananas out there, global trade is dominated by just one. Since the Second World War, 60% of plant genetic diversity has been lost, since farmers all over the world have left their multiple plant varieties for genetically uniform ones, creating highly productive from revenue standpoint, but also highly vulnerable food systems. As global food security today depends on a very narrow selection of plants and animals, it makes them incredibly vulnerable due to a greater risk of diseases, pests, and climate extremes. It also promotes malnutrition because most of these plants and animals hold the same nutrients and properties. Believe it or not, but odd cuisine is challenging this status quo by reintroducing a rich tapestry of foods. There are multiple examples of different chefs from all over the world creating their own little gardens and farms next to their restaurants where crop diversity thrives. And one of such crops, a really humble one, requires our special attention. Table. Our planet has given birth to more than 5,000 different types of potatoes. However, supermarkets today offer only 8 to 10 different varieties. So, not surprisingly, potatoes today are at the top of the dirty dozen vegetables, simply because potatoes are extremely vulnerable to any changes in weather. And they are so nutritious that they attract enormous amounts of different insects every year to feed on them. The fewer varieties of a particular plant, in our case potatoes, raw, the more species and insects and new hungry mouth are after it. Virgilio Martinez, a renowned chef from Peru, has created an experimental garden next to one of his restaurants, where he is growing 200 different varieties of native Peruvian potatoes, including wild potatoes, which are so full of nutrients and might hold the secret to resilience for many other different crops. At the end of the day, there should be a reason why, while potatoes are still around after 8,000 years of potato domestication, wild potatoes around the world are now being used as a reference of resilience 
for local farmers who are trying to reintroduce ancestral techniques of growing different crops. For example, the way they are treating the soils with different local plants. And this is giving them an opportunity to grow new, very nutritious crops for their local communities. Recent studies show that losses in global biodiversity increase transmissions of infectious diseases in many organisms, including humans, simply because biodiversity acts as a barrier between humans and the diseases that are coming from the animal world. As we continue to destroy natural habitats and upset ecosystems in unpredictable ways, this barrier, or better to say, this border between human world and animal world gets erased. Most of these infectious diseases require radical treatments and the use of antibiotics. Antibiotics found in nature or inspired in nature are absolutely life-saving and have enabled modern medicine. But today, Antibiotic resistance is becoming a growing concern, as some medicines are no longer as effective as they were designed to be. The rise of such resistance necessitates the discovery and development of new alternative treatments so that we do not go back to the pre-antibiotic era. And once again, nature can be the source of inspiration for us. In the jungle of Costa Rica, a very slow but fluffy creature might be holding the key to the pressing global issue. Researchers have found that sloth fur is home to abundant life, including insects, algae, fungi, bacteria. But despite of all of this diversity of thriving life in sloth fur, sloths actually possess incredible resistance to infections. As scientists continue to dig deeper into the fur of this fluffy animal, or better just say, continued uncovering the mechanism behind this paradox, scientists came across a very interesting fungi, antibiotic-producing bacteria, which is keeping sloths so healthy. Now this bacteria is being tested and synthesized in labs for potential use in curing bacterial illnesses in humans, which current antibiotics are no longer capable of fighting. <laughs> the relationship between kelp and humans date back millennia. These undersea forests not only provide three-dimensional experience for different sea creatures, but also have historically been appreciated by humans. We use them in medicine, food, cosmetics, and even animal feeds. Kelp is wonderful fertilizer because it absorbs the nutrients and antioxidants from clean water. But most importantly, we know today that kelp forests absorb carbon dioxide at a much higher level than land forests. This is because although trees are very good at storing carbon, this kind of storage is much more vulnerable since deforestation and forest depletion releases back carbon into the atmosphere, undoing the original benefit. Kelp, similarly to trees, takes up CO2 via photosynthesis. But contrary to trees, this carbon dioxide travels deep into the oceans where it is being sequestered. Some of the biggest kelp forests are located along Arctic and sub-Antarctic areas. This is because kelp absolutely loves cold water. In fact, it cannot live in warmer waters. If you have ever traveled to Western Europe or Alaska, for example, you know how fragrant water is. 
that is because of the iodine that comes from kelp. But if you travel to, let's say, Southern Asia or Africa or Latin America, water doesn't have the same fragrance. That is because of no or much smaller amounts of kelp. There are about 12,000 different types of kelp in our waters, at least the ones that humans know about. And the biggest of them can grow as high as 65 meters. And although most of kelp grows next to the shore, because similarly to plants, it needs sunlight to survive, there are nine times more kelp in water than there are plants on the land. More than a thousand different species, mammals, fish, birds, insects, even we humans depend on kelp. But as the waters are becoming warmer, the future of kelp is unfortunately becoming less certain. Biodiversity is a very delicate tangle which leaves its own life constantly changing, sometimes cutting off different species and sometimes introducing new species. Right now, we're losing nature like never before due to unsustainable human activities. Some 1 million species are threatened with extinction today. That's more than any other time in history as these species are disappearing at a rate that is a thousand times the norm. On the other hand, almost a thousand new species are being discovered every single year. And some of them are absolutely incredible and wouldn't be possible but for the unsustainable human activities. And please, all sustainable gods and goddesses, forgive me for saying this, but take, for example, new wax worms that thrive on polyethylene or gorgeous wasp spiders that enjoy absolutely hot summers in the south of the UK and are an incredibly fabulous, nutritious snack for birds. Whilst we need to be more careful with the nature around us, by preserving and replenishing it, I also believe that nature will always find its way to rebalance itself with or without our intervention. Basically the way it has been doing for the last 6 billion years, constantly evolving and becoming like never before every time. The real question is, is nature going to find its way to get rid of us as of something threatening like it would do with the microscopic bacteria on sloth fur? Or are we humans going to find new ways to interconnect with it, making this relationship mutually beneficial?